Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I talk to a clay artist who, because he actually really does talk about how he loves clay, even though the outcome of it is different for different people. He even likes to make pots, mugs, things like that, but he also likes to try unique things. Well, this sculptor here in Madison started out in retail. We actually have a fun conversation about our both of our experiences uh, starting out working in the mall. And oddly enough, we worked in the same mall. It's just that mine was... I think 20 years before him, but you know what I'm saying. And so anyway, moving on, he's, uh, he's working in a bunch of different uh, pottery studios. He met them through different courses that he took through uh, Madison Area College. And now what he decided to do, because he'd like to experiment more with what he does, and a lot of places won't let him. And this is not to their, you know, dismay. It's just they're going... Basically, they said, why don't you build your own place so you can try these things and break your own kiln? And he was like, maybe I will. And he found a partner uh, that wanted to open a studio as well. So he is in the process of opening a 24-hour pottery studio that people can rent out. He's going to teach classes. He's hoping to open very soon. So we talk all about that, what it's like to start your own business uh, or because he's in the process. So we find out really what's it like to try and start a business that is in the process of being made. It's a fun conversation. We had a great time. Uh, Here is my interview starting right now. I'm James Griffiths. I uh, teach pottery and I make ceramic stuff like uh, sculptures, pots, like cups and mugs. Um, and then I'm opening a pottery studio as well. So I guess I call myself a business owner, which feels <laughs> weird, and but it's what I am. So it's um, super exciting. Yeah. yeah. And you're based here in Madison right now, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm um, on the east side. We um near Oscar Meyer in the airport, if you know where. Oh, yeah. Are. Yeah. I'm where born I- and raised in Madison, so I know where that is. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's where I live. That's where the studio is going to be. It's a it's a great area. So I'm glad to be over here. And are you from Madison or did you move here? I'm from Minnesota. Um, oh. I came here to sell shoes, actually. Um, Journeys is a store in the malls and they were having a hard time running their stores. And I worked at another company where I was really, really great at retail management. And so just kind of through the chain of sequence of events, I ended up here to run the stores and then kind of realized, like, what am I doing in the mall? Like I was right. sitting there working a 12 hour day. I had to like lock the gate to use the bathroom and got (laughs) scolded for doing so. And I'm just like, dude, this is enough. And so I just like told the DM who had called me, the district manager um, who was scolding me for closing the gate. I was like, you know what? I I think this is enough. And I just kind of like locked it through the keys in the store and then went back to school. And that's how I fell into pottery was trying to do college again and realized also like, Hey man, I need to do something fun. That's Work a in- movie plot, by the way, that's you locked oh, it and threw the keys oh, in there. <laughs> it had been like years of buildup of this resent to these like higher ups in corporate management. It was just like, Oh, just like tossed him in the gate and went home, called my mom on the ride home. And it was just like, I quit. I was like, to be honest, I was pretty hysterical. I was just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't have a job. And she's like, it'll be all right. You'll figure it out. And, you know, yeah. long story short, I did, right? You just kind of have to. Right? Well, yeah. and I mean, you left the, you know, security of uh, mall businesses. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, without a college degree, I was like 20 years old. I was making $35,000 a year, you know, like working in the mall. It was this huge paycheck that I was getting to like, uh, I was a barista after that, oh, <laughs> you know, okay. so it wasn't like a great job change, but it worked while I was a student. That's the best job for a student, you know, free caffeine. You mm-hmm. can work when you're not in school. And I was living downtown, working downtown. So it worked real great. Well, and I assume you actually worked with other people because you were saying you had to lock the gate to go to the bathroom. I'm assuming that means you were by yourself in the store. I was at that time. Yeah, yeah. it was. It was crazy the way they work you in these stores is they call it like churn and burn. Basically, they know there's young people who need jobs. So they're like, "Eh, heck, we'll work you all day, every day. We don't care if it burns you out. We'll just hire someone new. And so this is like normal for them. But for me, it was this big dramatic thing. And I'm sure the DM was like, whatever, we'll get some other poor sucker to come in. So I feel bad for Alex, my assistant at that time, (laughs) because I'm pretty sure that he just inherited all the all the crap that I had just like dropped on the floor basically. So when around, around what time was this? Cause I don't remember that shoe store. 
Oh man, so that was the one in East Town Mall, and that one is now gone, I believe. It was probably five years ago, maybe almost six years ago now. Okay. Um, and then the one in West Town is still there. I was just oh. in the mall like a month ago and just, you know, walked by and didn't want to be that dude who was like, oh, I used to work here, but it was like, <laughs> you know, kind of neat to see because I was actually working in both stores driving back and forth because, you know, they need help. And, you know, I'm sure they can barely get people in those doors these days. Oh, right. That's um, what I mean. Like you walk into the mall yeah. now and it's like a ghost town. Like I, sometimes I walk was, in and I'm like, are you open? <laughs> East town is East town is weird these days, right? Yeah. There's like who shop in the mall now. Like you can tell they're desperate. They're just like, sure, we'll rent you whoever. It's uh, strange. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's funny. I worked in the mall back in the 90s. Not that this should be the show about working in malls. Or- we'll move on in a minute. But yeah, I worked at a place like in the 90s. <laughs> Uh, that was a much different experience. It was very much a, let's call it the, uh, uh, when I was in high school, it was basically like our version of Hot Topic, except it was locally owned. It was like the cool yeah. place where like you went to buy punk rock t-shirts, awesome. but also yeah. it had like weird like uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse figurines and stuff like that. So our thing yeah. was like, we got to play what we wanted. And when the manager left, it was pretty much like, hey, we're going to get high in the back room and draw all day. You know, like that, we had a yeah, much I mean- different experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, that's the mall for you, though. To be honest, even when I was there, like, that was when vaping was really big. And oh, right. I, me and the guy I worked with were joking. Like, people would come in and these clouds of vape would follow us out of the back room. And we're probably just like, dude, they probably thought we were like Cheech and Chong back there. Because, <laughs> you know, it's basically harmless. But, I mean, come on. It was right. Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, anyway, so we've talked enough yeah. about malls. So you did all that, but how did you, were you already making pottery at this time? Like what's your background with actually, like, how did you get started making Real pottery? Question. I like always loved clay. Okay. I, my, I say probably my first introduction to clay was at this like weird old guy's house. It sounds silly. <laughs> but I, like drop me off at this shed in this dude's yard and I'd hang out for like eight hours and the guy would like, let us make stuff, play with clay. We'd help him around the spot. It was called Flamingo Flats. And he had lawn flamingos everywhere, which is weird because that's like a big thing here in Madison. Right. So it's this weird tide that I have to my my history now. But like that was how it got started. And then every time I was in school, whether high school, you know, college, anywhere, I tried to get into clay. Hmm. Whether it was like in a class, I'd take a art class every semester. I was an art education major when I was attempting college. And I just not take the real classes and just sign up for all the art. And clay always had something. I don't know really what it was. Maybe there's a magnetism, a feeling. I mean, I love it now. I can talk eloquently about how it makes you feel now. But like back then, it was just like I'd make things like weird stuff. And it felt awesome. Yeah. And then I was going to Madison College when it was downtown still. And I was having a really hard time with school. And I took a... I think her name was Joanne Kirkland was the first one I took a pottery class with and that relit the fire. I was like, this is cool. And then as the semesters went, there was progressively real credits or I'm sorry, less real credits and more pottery classes to the point where I'd taken all the ceramics classes and I was just like retaking the same one with this uh, sculpture teacher because he didn't care. He just let me hang out, make stuff. And I just like, didn't want, I had to trick everyone into thinking I was going to school, right? you know, because to be like a college student but really i'm just like yeah this art shit is really fun yeah and um i started working for them as like a student staff member and then just realized like man i want to do this but i don't want to finish college because i don't want to do math i don't want to do science i just want to do art and so i i put myself out there you know i went to this studio dongju pottery that had just opened this would have been probably four years ago maybe three Boy, when Leja Dongju, who's from the West Side, he went to West High School. He just like wanted to open a studio and did. How did you meet? Um, I actually just met him by seeing the studio on Instagram. Okay. Um, brand new. Like there was no members. I think maybe one or two people making stuff there. And I just like went there one day and it was only at that time like 90 bucks a month to be a member. And that was about what I would make in tips. So I was like, sure, I'll just throw you my tip money, start making stuff here. And I just like, I was trying to be there. I was like, I want to figure out how to get a job here was sort of my goal. And I just put myself there, which is how I got jobs in the mall. You know, you're that annoying kid showing up every day. Like, Oh, I like skateboards, you know, like, and then you're working at zoomies. Like, so I did the same thing with this pottery scene. And then 
something happened with his manager at that time. And he's like, I need help tomorrow. And I'm like, well, um, I don't have a job. Let's do it. Yeah. And so I like basically cleaned him off the floors for like two years and then started oh. teaching a little bit. And then as I was teaching there, you know, then I could go to like the school district and be like, hey, I teach pottery. And then I started working in their community recreation program teaching. Yeah. And then get a job in another space, you know. And so now I'm teaching in four studios and just making art on the side. Sorry, uh, yeah. how, how does that work with with the because I do see a lot of different uh, pottery studios and uh, I guess I don't know yeah. what they're called. Are they ceramic or pottery studios or I guess I don't know the official name. That's a really interesting distinction, right? Because yeah. Those are very different things, but it's the same material. Yeah. And you think of. Ceramic would imply things that maybe don't function, but pottery kind of has to function, right? Mm -hmm. Like a coffee mug is pottery, but like a sculpture is ceramic. I don't know. Weird. Um, but yeah, so I would call them all pottery studios because they teach pottery classes. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what people know. Yeah. Um, but like the place I'm opening, I'm hesitant to call it a pottery stu studio. I want to call it a clay studio because I don't like to necessarily just make pottery. I really like to make sculpture and that's not pottery. And it's weird because sculpture is art, but pottery is not art. So it, it, yes, ceramics is a weird middle ground between craft and art that right. I find fascinating. And I could rant about even that for hours, you know, go to, go to the Chazen and there's no modern coffee mugs. There's no modern vases. It's only old pottery or mm -hmm. ceramic sculpture. Right. And as a person that really likes to make cool coffee mugs, that's like weird because I, I want to make it, but it's not art. But what is art? Art is subjective. You know, I, it, but according to art with a capital A, like that industry, because it has a function that eliminates it as an art, it yeah. is now a craft. Well, yeah. And it even, yeah. it's the same sort of thing with me. Like um, you can go to the chase and, and you don't see like, Web comics, you know, web nope. comics aren't considered art. But if you're like Dude, a yeah. underground comic artist from the 60s who used to be viewed as like, you know, uh, they they were immoral. Now, all of a sudden they have their own showing of like, here's underground art from this uh, comics from the 60s. Yeah. yeah. So apparently it just takes time. So in about 20 years, the mugs you're talking about will be yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but no, that's that's actually a yeah. very good point. Like it's. And, and it really is the whole, you know, the, the classic saying like, but is it art? You know, it, the thing that we all like to joke about, it's, it's like, well, it yeah. doesn't at some point, and especially with the internet and that's the beauty of it. It's like, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, it's, it's, it can be wherever you find it and it really can be. Now there is access. Yes. In the museum, it would be nice to get that yeah. in there. But also at the same time, it's like, it's like with musicians and record labels. Do you really need them anymore? You know, it, well, not that I'm, yeah. oh my God, not that I'm no, <laughs> dispelling museums whatsoever. Yeah. I'm no, just saying it, the access is there. Tough, right. Like you go to a shop and they want like a gallery. They want to take 50% of your work just for selling it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like crazy. So I don't even use any of that to sell pots. I just use Instagram. You know, it's like right. you want something cool. Come see me at a store like we'll sell you to me. And just like you're talking about, you kind of are eliminating that industry in a way or that middleman that's normally, I guess, marketing you. But like they don't let's be real. They just put it on the shelf and put a sticker on it and then. Hand yeah. It well, Which I mean, is under and that is their model. You know, that is what they're there for. And that's like the standard. So, yeah, it's like you got to either do the work or I guess pay the fee. The convenience fee is sort of the way I think about it. Yeah. Now, tell me about how uh, I'm actually interested by this because I've looked at your Instagram and you don't really have like yeah. a cart or anything set up, but you're saying right. that you put it on Instagram and you sell it. So what is your process yeah. for like actually selling online without an actual storefront or, or not storefront, but uh, online store or anything like that? How do you do it? So I noticed I get the best engagement through stories. Mm -hmm. And this is something I adapted from people who I see tattooing and how they sell their designs is they basically make a post on their story with a photo of the item and then a price. Mm -hmm. And then when someone claims that they repost it with like an X drawn through it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty neat way. And so I will often just take a picture of something and just write, you know, either a price or make me an offer. And I'll within minutes, I'll get a reply. Often. Really? Someone sees it and then it's sold. And then I get 30 other people who are like, hey, I want it. So there's <laughs> a, there's a convenience of having the storefront, which I would like to have one day where they can click the button and then see that it's sold out. Right. Right. And I'm not fielding all these messages for two days after the post. Like, 
you know, thankfully Instagram disappears in 24 hours. So mm. it's a really convenient way oh, to, yeah. to move stuff. And the engagement on a story is like huge, but I could make a regular post about a pot that I want to sell. And I only, you know, four of my friends will see it. Hmm. So it, I, I don't, I don't know social media well enough to have understanding, but I've been noticing that as long as I'm focused with my stories and then uh person to person is how I sell most of my stuff. I yeah. do like missions as I guess you'd say it. So like, uh, my biggest seller is putting people's logos on coffee mugs. Oh, I throw really simple, generic coffee mugs that are good size, function well, easy to wash and clean and use. And then I screen print a business's logo on the front. Um, so I've made some for a coffee shop in town. I've done Black oh. Saddle bike Shop, who's a really cool bike shop here on the east side. And then um, I'm going to actually be dropping soon um, ones for the Mallards and the Forward, who are our... Um, I don't know. I, minor league's the wrong word, but they're not pro teams. Right. You know, they're the team on the soccer and the baseball teams, which are awesome. And that I just found through uh, one of the members on their staff. They were redoing their logo for the Mallards, I think, last year, the year before. Right. Got it maybe three years ago now. With COVID, the time disappeared. Um, <laughs> but they redid Maynard, you know, and did these new launch. And all their merch actually is local stuff now. Wait, the cool. Dutch name was Maynard? Yeah, they did. They changed Maynard. They got a whole new whole new look it's really way better in my opinion the last one is this really angry like almost get alligator looking oh, duck yeah. i remember he's one goofy looking guy which is how i think uh those kind of um what are they called uh mascot that's the word i'm looking right. for yeah that's goofy and fun if you're making these mugs like are you making a lot of them like are you mass pro not mass producing but like hand making a bunch or are you just doing a select few? Like what's the, what's the order? Good question. Um, it started out in like really small batches. Um, the convenience of teaching is I repeat the beginning steps of making a small mug. You could say like probably five times a week, every single week, oh. you know, like constantly going through the motions. And so I've gotten extremely efficient. And I'm able to work in, I do batches of 25. And so that's like the smallest I would like to make. And so if say someone wants like a few, I would make a big chunk and then a few of them would go to them. A few of them I would sit in a box. You know, what's cool about clay is you can kind of halfway make it, you could say, yeah. and then store it till you're ready to do the glazing, which is like the coloring and the decorating and oh. then finish that at a later date. And so like right now I have four boxes of basically blank mugs that are just waiting for me to put the logos on and then put the clear glass on. That's what we call glaze and then fire it the last time, which will make it ready for food and then also have the logo. And you said you're screen printing this like, OK, so you yeah. started making pottery. When did you really dis yeah. I mean, obviously, the next step is like putting because you could draw it on, but you also are screen printing. When did yep. you start incorporating that into what you do? That happened like probably three years ago. I saw this guy, Isaac Scott, who uh, graduated from West High School here in town. Um, he's a very talented potter and also photographer. He took some amazing shots during the riots, during the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the riots that were happening in Philadelphia. Okay. I highly recommend if anyone's listening to look up Isaac Scott fucking awesome pardon my french but he really is cool dude cool art and like wicked stuff but he showed me these silk screens and just printing layered images on these cups and these mugs and it was like mind-blowing i was like wait a minute you can screen print on pottery because that's something i really enjoyed in high school i was trying to make t-shirts i wanted to have a t-shirt brand this mm -hmm. is when i was all doing that thing that's all you think about is clothing and t-shirts and so I understood screen printing and could already do all of it, but I never thought of crossing that genre or. I know. I and it's so obvious when you see it, you're just like, oh, duh, of course, that's how like my Garfield mug was made. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and oftentimes they're done as like a decal where they print it and then they apply it in what's often referred to as overglaze. Mm hmm. You make a mug, you fire it and then you make the sticker and then you refire it and then the sticker's baked on. Hmm. The way Isaac did it was putting this like colored clay through the screen right on the coffee mug. So you kind of cut it out of the frame. So, you know, we think of silk screens as these wood frames with like a green image that you rub ink through to make like a T-shirt, you could say. 
Well, I'm cutting it out of the frame. So it's like a loose floppy piece of paper. I bend it around the pottery and just kind of like rub a color through with my thumb. Oh, and like really loose and fun. And so like doing the Mallards logo is a great one to talk about because it takes me five layers. So it's five colors. I'll do like uh, two of the background colors, let it dry. I'll do another layer, let it dry, do another layer. So I can set out 25 mugs and just go down the line, like doing the blue, doing the green, doing the gray. And then the last one is the black outline. If you go look at a like classic comics, that's a really great way to kind of look at it because you'll see color blocking behind and then the black outline layered on top mm -hmm. and crisps everything up. That's sort of how I visualize these images I'm doing. And it gives me the freedom to do crazy ones like the Mallards or simple ones like Black Saddle was just a black bicycle seat and then the words Black Saddle. Okay. Super simple, right? I love those because it's just like, boom, crank those out. But <laughs> the complex ones, I'm trying to line all this stuff up. But I really push the concept that these are handmade and handcrafted. So nothing's perfect. Yeah. Every single one of a kind. And that's a whole nother can of worms, you know, because some people think they're getting these like, oh, things I could buy at Target or super consistent mugs. And mm -hmm. early on, I learned that lesson the hard way, making a bunch of stuff for someone. And they're just like, oh, they're not as consistent. They're not as heavy as I thought. And then I'm like, well, no, crap, now I have 150 mugs that they don't want. I don't want <laughs> do with them. And so then you just let them go at a discount or something, you know, but okay. I learned that. Don't make 150 at a time. Like you deliver 25 or 50 and then they order another 25 and then, you know, everyone's happy, hopefully. Right. Yeah. And what do you mean? They're not as, I guess I wouldn't think that they're, you'd get a comment like they're not as heavy. That's yeah. That was a weird one. <laughs> if you go and you go to like a coffee shop and you get a latte. It comes in like a really specific type of ceramic mug. Yeah. Like a big giant weight. one. Yeah. It feels solid. Uh -huh. Like the ones I was making were slip casted, which is a method of kind of like the way a toilet is made. You pour liquid porcelain in a mold and then dump it out. And you're left with this like shell of clay. Okay. They were very light because of the way they were made. They didn't have that same heft. And I think that that was where the comet came from. Okay. And in retrospect, they were probably super fragile and would have probably broken quickly. Mm -hmm. I, they were kind of a, well, it was like one of the first big pro projects I took on. So they were kind of poorly made. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing yet. And I still don't, but I know more, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah. You you yeah. learn the hard way as a lot of us do. Yeah. Dude, it's the story of my life. Like everything's the hard way. Yeah. I got to mop the floor the hard way. Sweep, sweep the hard way. It's like, yeah, but you learn better that way. Right. At right. least I do. Yeah. Well, I love the fact that you just uh, likened the making of a giant latte mug to a toilet bowl. First of all, <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally the same. It's yeah, it's it's funky when you go and you start realizing how ceramic is arguably one of the more important materials we've ever had. Yeah. Like because you think of clay as like coffee mugs and then you're like, oh, wait, toilet sinks. Every single urinal you've ever used like yeah. is thing. Lip casting. No, and I wanted, I actually yeah. wanted to ask you about that when I'm glad you brought it up because one of the things I've seen, like when I've come across like, uh, say some different mugs or even different sculptures, I'll be like, oh, that's ceramic, but you'll see like the label or something that's on it and it says porcelain. And I'm like, well, how, how's that? But it's like, yeah, no, porcelain clearly is. Is it a form of clay or is it like, how is porcelain different from ceramic? Not that this is super important, but I am curious. Yeah, that is, yeah, so the word ceramic is weird, right? Because okay. it's actually referring to the fired product of certain clays. Okay. And I say certain clays because I think of clay as like a really generic word, meaning a lot of different stuff. We think of it as like you go out and you dig it up out of the ground, and that certainly is clay, but it's not like clay I can make a coffee mug with, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And clay is based on the stone in the ground of that region and porcelain specifically is I, I fairly certain porcelain comes from feldspar. And so like historically you'd only find it in certain areas of the world. We think of that as mostly Japan and China. Okay. Um, it can be found in other regions, but that's why like we think of China ware or Japanese made ceramics as one porcelain and two extremely valuable 
because prior shipping and trains, it was really hard to get. Like I wouldn't be able to get porcelain hundreds of years ago. Like okay. it just wouldn't be a thing. And now I can make it in a bucket in my garage, you know? <laughs> okay. So, but it's also not really porcelain in a way because it's not made by the earth through like decomposing stone or rotting stone, however you want to think about it. Mm -hmm. But like terracotta is another example. That's what we think of as red clay. You go and buy those nice red flower pots for your plants. Hmm. Previously, before we could make it, you could really only find that in like Mexico, South America, hmm. the Southwest of the United States. It's super porous, really good at absorbing water and then releasing it. And so like that would only come from that region, red clay, right? Or maybe a lot in Africa. I'm very, I don't understand the continents and where clays come from well, but I know it's very regional. Right? Yeah. No, um, and that concept explains a like, lot. Yeah. Yeah. So we call it stoneware because it looks like stone when it's fired. Um, terracotta. Oh boy, I should know the translation, but I think it's of the earth or something along those lines. And I'll that's, take your word for it. You a riverbed in you know, like Arizona and pull up the richest red clay you've ever seen because there's a bunch of iron in that soil. Um, the soil you find in a riverbed is more terracotta than stoneware. Okay. And so to get really confusing here, the families are stoneware, earthenware, porcelain. Hmm. They're all sort of ceramic, but they're only ceramic when they're fired before mm. firing their clay. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, kind of like how it's bread until it's toast. Perfect. That's a great comparison. I thought that was genius, and I just thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because kilns work just like toasters. It's like a metal wire. You run a bunch of electricity through it. It gets hot, and then you put stuff in a space with that wire, and it gets really toasty. Okay. I call my kiln toasters because they work on the same functional level. They just go to, like, 2,000 degrees instead of uh, maybe 40 or 50. I don't know how hot toasters okay. get. Well, that actually yeah. answers a question that I've been wondering. And okay, that actually makes a lot of sense. All right. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. Of, of course. Always, always nice to have a person on that can attest to something that I want to know about. Now, to get yeah. back to, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you had mentioned when you were uh, doing these things uh, originally and selling them online, and you said there were different storefronts that people could go see them at. So you had gotten the job at the one place. And this yep. is working up to what you're currently doing is what I'm getting at here. So how did you yeah. find these? You're, I want to say you were working at like four different uh, pottery studios. Busy as four studios. Now I'm down to three for a short time. And okay. then I'll be, I think back to th four again soon. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Basically, I wanted to make money doing pottery. Yeah. And I didn't understand how to like sell stuff yet. And I didn't make stuff worth selling. This is something I deal with internally is like, what is worth selling, right? Is mm -hmm. it good enough, right? Um, I can get into that later. But the way I figured is like, I want to teach. I happen to be really good at it. I didn't know that. I just got, took it and everyone's like, wow, you're great at this. And I'm like, all right, I guess I lean into it. Mm. I think the salesman in me is really good at just working with people, right? Yeah. And um, so I went to MSCR, which is the school district's um, after school community program right. and just said, hey, I teach. If you need anyone, let me know. I would love to teach. I'll teach whatever you want me to teach. And mm. so then I started working there. And then I was like, well, I need more money to pay my bills. So I went to a place called The Wheelhouse, which is in the Memorial Union and just did the same thing. I just started kind of giving people my business card and being like, when you need a teacher, I'm there, you know, and it's weird hours. Like right now I teach Monday night, Tuesday night, Tuesday morning, Thursday night, and then sometimes Friday nights. And then in between there, I have to try to fill in income by making and selling work, mm -hmm. right? And the teaching thing is sort of a means to an end. To be honest, I would love to just not have to teach and to hang out and make things all day and have that somehow pay my bills. Oh, yeah but I haven't worked that out yet. Right. So the teaching is like, uh, basically contracts. So I sign a contract for like a five week session and I know I'm getting this much money at the end of that month. And so hopefully then I can get enough of that to pay the bills. And thankfully I got some cool family that are willing to like throw me a bone every now and then if I'm in a tight spot. Okay. Without their support, I probably wouldn't have been able to make it work the way I did. Uh, it's been very, starving artist if you want to use you know the the common nomenclature but it's like 
you know, just getting by, making ends meet. And then this studio I'm opening is hopefully to be able to teach enough classes weekly to be able to make enough income that then I can really relax. Well, and explain but, to me the thought process uh, behind this. So you're, you're opening your own yeah. place. Like uh, uh, how long ago did you decide to do this? And also why? <laughs> Great. Um, I wanted to, as soon as I went to Dongju and I saw another person my age doing this, like Leja worked at the UW hospital and loved pottery and just did it like on a whim. This dude had, very little clay experience. He like didn't go to school for it besides high school. Right. Mm -hmm. And was just like, I want to do this. And he did it. He just found a spot, bought a bunch of wheels and started teaching beginner classes. Hmm. And when you're doing these things and in these, in the industry, so to speak, you start to connect the dots on like how much money is made and how much things can cost. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize like, Oh man, like to be blunt, there's a lot of money here because we're charging a lot for monthly rent and for classes. And really, once you pay me, your costs are, I mean, not minimal, but relatively low. Right. I, and so it's also really popular in Madison. I don't know why mm -hmm. here specifically, but we have like, I can speak for five pottery studios that right. all have like a hundred members. They're all full of members. Those people pay a monthly fee to use the space. They're all teaching like, four classes a week at least all those classes are full of eight students each and there's wait lists of like 20 to 30 people at every location oh wow i have and this is partially i think covid partially the popularity of some tv shows i think they were all there already though that's what i'm saying like they, i look around they, and i see him he's the newest one and he's been there now for four or five years yeah and so like after teaching in these places and working in these places i was like okay there's a need but I'm in this weird position now where I want to make uh, certain things and I need to do certain techniques or I want to try sketchy stuff, you could say. And the guy <laughs> that I rent space from right now at Midwest Clay Project is like, dude, I don't want you to do that in my kiln, you know, or like, like what? what's what's this sketchy stuff? I'm intrigued. <laughs> Good question. Um, like maybe crash cooling. So you open it at a really hot temperature and force it to cool quickly. And then crystals will develop in the glaze. Or I want to put things that burn in the clay so that when the clay is firing, those things burn away and leave voids. Oh. You, then you're creating carbon and messing up the ventilation. Or maybe you're using a metal in your glaze that makes the kiln brick kind of get gross. Um and having the freedom to experiment would be really cool. It's sort of what you get. But to I get where they're coming from then. Even you describing that, I'm like, that sounds cool. But they're like, go break your own kiln. <laughs> exactly what my mentor told me. He's like, I, I appreciate the thought, but he's like, not here. Right. And I, I wanted to do this stuff in my house. I, I have the kiln. I had the money. And then I had this electrician come in and basically explain everything I'd have to do to make this kiln work in my house. And I was like, oh, my God, this could be four grand this could be 15 grand mm. and that's a ton of money like i could buy a car with that yeah and i'd always wanted to open my own studio it's like something i've done like i said since i started teaching basically at dongju i was like cool this is great but i i would do it this way i could do it better so, you know it sounds cocky but it was sort of true you know you see but everybody has stuff. that thought yeah dude exactly and and i'm determined to do it and then my good friend who's another potter in the area comes to me and is just like, Hey, uh, I'm losing my job. I have a bunch of money. I've always wanted this. I need a pottery space. And he has been apprenticing with a guy in Cambridge, like living in a shed, firing a wood fired kiln, Japanese style, like wow. really cool. Stuff. Not stuff I do, but very cool pottery. Right. Yeah. And he wanted a space and we're very much alike in the sense that like we're young, we want to do something our way mm -hmm. and we're both really stubborn. And so we kind of had this money and we're just like, let's make this work, dude. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of banged our heads together and started working out how a pottery studio would work. And what's cool about what we're trying to do is there's this weird intermediate level in ceramics where like a community studio is great because you can easily come into a space, use the tools provided make nice coffee mugs and then have them fired for you. Mm -hmm. 
But like Brian at Midwest Clay Project didn't want me doing weird stuff. Yeah. Or if I make 50 coffee mugs, I have to wait a long time for them to go through the kiln because there's a hundred other people using the kiln too. Yeah. Um, what if I wanted to rent that kiln? You know, or maybe I need a space to make a really big, awkward sculpture. I want to make a fountain for my front yard Mm -hmm. and it would take up the whole kiln in one firing. And he's like, dude, come on, you're making this difficult for me. He's trying to run a business. So I thought there's a pottery studio that's like an in between where you can do weird things because there's a lot of kilns available. Maybe there's a really junky one for you to throw salt inside of or something to make something crazy happen. Okay. Or. You want to make a large sculpture and fire it over the whole weekend and take a really long time to do it. I wanted that space. And so me and Brendan kind of realized like, well, we can do that. We've each been collecting tools. We've got kilns. We understand what it would take to do these things. Right. And Mm -hmm. so we just did. We threw our money together. I found a guy that will broker a space for you. He kind of goes out and finds commercial spaces and you know, he's like a real estate agent. But okay. I was going to ask how you found the space. Okay. And, and where it, is no, this space? Yeah. So this space is, um, it's on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is, um, right by Oscar Meyer, right off of Packers and commercial Avenue. Okay. Um, and it's a warehouse and it's cool. We're right next to cycle works, which is a local community bicycle space. Mm-hmm. And, found a decent landlord and just this wicked huge warehouse where we can basically set up our dream space, um, hook up all our kilns. Brendan's family members have a little property about five or 10 minutes away in DeForest. Oh, and so we're building brick kilns out there so we can fire kilns using wood and gas with really traditional, like Japanese style firing. And we're going to teach people and like, not just teach them to do it, but like teach them how to do it. So ideally you would learn like essentially like a license in a way to fire a kiln Mm -hmm. and then you pay us a fee, you load it, you put the wood in, you handle it. Right now you would have to pay like hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get like a quick course, you know, get a few pots in a kiln. It's hard to do. Right. And I want to make that available, but in like economic way, someone like me who wants to fire a hundred mugs can come in, rent the space for a month, you know, rent a kiln just basically pay me electrical cost plus a little bit for maintenance, Mm -hmm. maybe a loading fee if you don't load it yourself. And like, that's kind of where the business plan started. And now I've just been like sitting down and a lot of this is going to be trial and error and just learning as we go, you know, I'll be like, well, it was really great to charge you only, but you know, my kilns are breaking down. I need more to pay for parts or something, you know, and yeah, who knows? how a lot of that'll work until I start doing it, which is what a lot of the advice I got Mm -hmm. is like, you know, you can plan for everything, but you just kind of got to start doing it and figure it out as you work. The money still has to come in. Yeah. (laughs) So we'll be teaching classes out of the space. Well, I should say I will be, and my business partner will be as well. Okay. And the goal is if I can teach enough of those, that'll pay rent. And then I'm renting out spaces to some other local artists in the area who will like basically pay me for a nice work area. And then they'll get affordable kiln access. Mm-hmm. And between that, rent will get paid. And if rent gets paid, you know, everyone's happy, ideally. One thing I yeah. saw that you were doing too, and I don't know if the other places do this, but I want to say on your website, it uh, says that it's going to be 24 hour uh, access. That was very important for me. And I learned that at um, Midwest Clay Project, where I was a staff member and making that's where like I made all the mugs for the mallards in the forward because okay. I needed a or mine is ready. And that's my mentor, Brian's space. And he's got this awesome setup where as a member, you rent a shelf, you get a door code and you have full access whenever the heck you want it. You Mm -hmm. put stuff on a shelf, it gets fired for you. You pick it up like super convenient. Yeah. But like difficult for a like what I would call an intermediate to full time potter. Right. Or a full time artist, because you're like, man, it's great that I have access to this space, but like. Why is there a fingerprint on my sculpture? You know, what happened? <laughs> it sounds like so, you know, rough or like another space. I got a bunch of mugs back and there was all this glass and crap glued to the bottom from the firing. And I'm like, well, that wasn't from me. So how did that get there? And then, you know, so I need that like weird middle ground area. And so like with us, we're going to have the same thing. Door code. Basically, you rent a 10 by 10, 20 by 10. You know, you get a big area. Come and go as much as you want. And then I'm going to offer memberships in like an open studio basis. So if you're 
less advanced or you don't want to be in there 24 hours a day, you can rent a shelf like Brian does mm -hmm. and just have a small area to come in during like certain times where you're allowed. That okay. way, if you're a hobbyist, you don't have to pay me, you know, $285 a month for a private studio. You can pay me something more affordable. We're looking at like $105 for the open studio membership. Okay. Yeah. You know? And it kind of hit all the bases. But, you know, then again, I may find I don't want that open studio stuff or that wasn't good. We needed more right. access. It wasn't affordable. So it sucks. And this is what is exciting is I could sit here and daydream about this stuff all day. Mm -hmm. All day. Wonderful and awful, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like but art or doing a web comic, I'm sure, where you're like, man, I've got a thousand ideas and you just want to sit there and daydream and then it comes time to do them. And it's like, oh gosh, <laughs> now I'm sweating. Well, and that's that's kind of what happened was is I only, the one that I do specifically, like I have other stuff that I work on, but then I do my daily web comic. But the, when I first started doing it, I all of a sudden I'd be like, Jesus, I've been drawing this for an hour. You know, like, is this all I'm going to do all day? Like I have other things to do. So I- Channel, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I do is I just go, it, it's basically like, all right, you have 15 minutes, try and see what you can do, you know, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, well, that's what I did today. You know, it's, it's yeah. the same sort of thing. It's, it's those kind of, but I didn't know until I tried, but when I first started, I'm like, yeah, this is not the right way to go about it. I'm not, I'm not working for Marvel. This is a free thing that I'm just posting on my site. I'm not making any money off of it yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, it's so hard, especially when you're doing something like a craft that you love and then you're trying to make it like a job. Right. And it, it, yeah, it's, it's intense. But yeah. then the, the, your mind starts going like, uh, you also have to see like, is this going to work? Like you said, like renting out the space, is that going to be a good thing? Or is it like, no, it should be teaching or is, are you going to do teaching just to a point And then maybe you're able to expand. It's all those things, but you don't know until you start doing it. Whereas you could speculate, but it's me yeah. in the meantime, you've rent to pay on the place that you just got. <laughs> Yeah. And that's exactly it. Right. Like my dream is this weird intermediate level pottery studio, but that doesn't exist. And maybe there's a reason. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we'll out. Um, but like I'm at this point in my life where, you know, I'm not married. I don't have children. I'm in a comfortable place. So like, so to speak, I have nothing to lose. Like right. I have a cat and myself. And if I myself, we're set. And thankfully we can survive on minimal food. So it's like, go for it, dude. And then, you know, I got a supportive family who, when they heard, they're just like, dude, what do you need? How can I help? Like, they've already driven down to help me just like move tables because I got a tiny car. Right. And that's something you realize. It's like, oh, man, it'd be really nice if I had a truck. I know. You know? I and recently like, had to do some moving and I have like a Mitsubishi Mirage and it's like, yeah, nothing's yeah. fitting in this damn thing. Yeah, no, I drive a Camry. It's like a great, it's super fuel efficient, gets me where I need to go, but like it can only hold so much clay. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> I've maxed it out a few times. I bottomed out on my last clay trip. It was like the guy at the clay company is like, eesh, man, I don't know if we can get any more in here. I'm like, just throw it in. I know. It's just, so dense it, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You're just dragging your bumper as you're driving and you have tons of clay in it. Aries. It. it looked like a boat, like an old Buick. It was low to the ground, and like I could, wow. I could barely get in my driveway. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll have a delivery next time. Is the idea? Yeah. Okay. Now, what would you say is like the hardest thing about trying to start this business? What What's the thing that you uh, have found the most difficult out of the whole process so far? Yeah. Um. Like, I guess I would say red tape, for lack of a better word. There's so many weird things to opening a small business that you don't consider. Like you think, oh, I can just make an LLC and then I can just start like collecting payments. And it's like, OK, no, you have to. How do you collect payments? What kind of fees? How do you collect taxes? Um, the big one with getting this commercial space was just like dealing with landlords, mm -hmm. dude. Um, I bought a house and that was a rush, right? Like buying a house was insane. I was like, this is so much. And then I went to do this commercial stuff and I was like, oh, hell, I got this. I bought a house. I'm upset. <laughs> and I started calling around and it was like talking to sharks, man. It took me back to being in the mall and just the hustle. They're all trying to get me to represent, you know, like all this crazy stuff. And that was when I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? And I found this company called Cressa, which is who I got this broker through. And this guy, TJ Blitz, if you're ever looking to start a business, get into Cressa. This guy, TJ, was amazing. He basically talked to me about what I needed. And then like a real estate agent would do, brought me a portfolio and was like, these are all the spots. 
he handled all the negotiation, all the talking with the landlord, because like there's weird things about like fees, um, what kind of property taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, I really wanted the landlord to pay for all the electrical work because you're getting a warehouse with nothing in it. And then to get a bunch of kilns working and you think of like, uh, well, I didn't know this, but like the wattage or the voltage usage of a pottery wheel. Mm. You can't have four potter wheels plugged into one outlet or you're going to trip a break, you know, and like things I learned in my house trying to, you know, hook up my own home studio. But I didn't think about for the space. Mm -hmm. And so then I got a quote for electrical of like twelve thousand dollars. And I was like, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, what? And so, you know, the broker worked some magic and got the landlord to pay for all of it. You know, we just had to guarantee it. So like, say we go out of business, you know, we're going to owe that much at least. But that made sense to the landlord and us, if you think about it, because then I don't have to tear out all the electrical work when I leave because I'm not paying for it. You know, I could leave and then he has mm. a nice equipped warehouse ready for a shop of some kind. Right. Yeah. Because sort of what we are in terms of like what the government thinks. They're like, are they a wood shop? Are they a uh, manufacturing? Because like pottery studio doesn't really exist in like the city's eyes. They're like, how do we classify you? What kind of zoning are you in? This is more of that bureaucracy, red tape type stuff that you just don't know about. And then they're like, well, you need two bathrooms in that space in order to do business. And I'm like, what do you want to open next month? And so we're waiting to hear from an architect if we have to have a second bathroom installed, Mm -hmm. like all kinds of crazy stuff. And that would limit my occupancy, you know? And so I could only have one bathroom, but then only 15 people can be in there at one point. Right. It's like... Oh my goodness. <laughs> a, amazing set of members or sorry, members, mentors, um, like, you know, Leja Dongju at Dongju Pottery, um, Brian Kluge, who runs the Midwest Clay Project, uh, even Gloria over at the Wheelhouse, all these pottery studios, Nikki, who manages Dongju now, they've all just been like super helpful and forward, you know, like, here's my problems. Here's what you need to watch out for. And pottery is so popular in Madison. It's been yeah. so easy to find people excited and helpful. You know, there's a kiln guy in town that is going to be here to help us with our kilns. And I don't know why Madison is so into pottery, but I ended up in like the right place to do this. And I figure why not give it a shot, you know, especially while it's really trendy and everyone's talking about it. Well, right? let's hope that it stays that way too. Well, let me get started and then, <laughs> then you can quit caring, right? <laughs> well, and then to uh, ask you one more question is yeah. uh, when, when do you expect this to be open? Speaking of that. So when do you, yeah. when well, do you plan? Cost, assuming this bathroom situation stuff, which we think we have sorted, should be good. We're planning to open in August. Nice. Um, and that'll be, I'll start posting for classes in the end of the month here. I was supposed to start that on Monday, is um, figuring out how to post all that stuff to Square and then how to add that to the website. You know, talk about more crap you learn as a small business owner. Like I've gotten really good at, you know, figuring out how these websites work and how to get a storefront set up, you right. know, and all look nice. Like I got to, I got to write nicely. And I like to swear and say the word dude a lot. And <laughs> especially. And so my dad is a lawyer. And so I channel him whenever I need to write something. I'm like, all right, how would my dad say this? You know, what would be the legalese he would use? And my business partner was like, dude, you're really good at writing. He's like, you need to write everything. So I'm doing our bios. <laughs> You know, I'm writing all these thank you letters to people who donated to our GoFundMe. It was like, it was a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in August, that's actually, okay. That's nice. That's a good timeline. I'm being honest, but that's when I want to have it happen because fall comes quick. You know, summertime is going to like happen. And then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh crap, it's getting cold. What do we do? Right. And I want to have classes ready in there and I figured why not go August? It's a good month. I got nothing planned. So let's make it happen. So if people wanted to know more about this, where would you suggest they go to learn about you, what you make, and this new studio? Where should they go? Great question. Um, we have a website. It is thekilnshed.studio. And kiln is K-I-L-N, uh, like a kiln, a uh, pottery kiln, a uh, glass kiln. And um, we also have a Facebook, which is The Kiln Shed. Um, I made a Instagram that I'm, I'm hoping to start posting on. I'm new to the whole, you know posting weekly thing but we're trying to make it happen um and that is kiln shed without the because somebody beat me to it Uh Um, 
But you'll find me on all those things. I'm going to be posting quite a bit. Um, we're going to be sending out emails. So if you go to my website and you subscribe with your email, I'll be sending out really cool welcome emails with info on our grand opening, how to sign up for classes, how to become a member if you're interested in you know coming into the space and getting a tour. I want to start giving tours next month, so I'll be setting up appointments for that soon. So absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm glad I got the chance to meet you. Totally. Thanks for having me.